Hello, and welcome to your hierarchical clustering lecture. Now, as the name implies, hierarchical clustering assumes that the clusters that we create have a hierarchical relationship. And what does that look like? Well, a really good example is blood cells. Blood is made up of different groups of cells, like red blood cells, white blood cells, plasma, and platelets. But when we look at any of those groups, like white blood cells, we can see that it is made up of other groups of cells. For instance, we have basophils, lymphocytes, and neutrophils. But it doesn't stop there. If we look at lymphocytes, we can see that it is made up of other groups, like B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells. And T cells are also made up of groups of cells like helper T cells, suppressor T cells, memory T cells, and killer T cells. Taken all together, you can see that these groups have a hierarchical relationship. The overarching groups are themselves made up of smaller subgroups, which are made up of smaller subgroups and so on and so forth. And that's the entire idea with hierarchical clustering. We assume that our clusters are made up of subclusters, which are themselves made up of subclusters and so on and so forth. We're going to do a type of hierarchical clustering called agglomerative clustering. This basically means that every data point starts off as its own cluster, and then we selectively merge them together until all of our data points are in a single cluster. When we do hierarchical clustering, we build a tree called a dendrogram that helps us visualize the hierarchical relationships between our clusters. In agglomerative clustering, we're starting at the bottom of this tree structure where every data point is its own cluster, and we're moving up and merging through the tree until we get to the top. Luckily, the algorithm for this is incredibly simple. At each step, we're just going to merge the two closest clusters. When we first start, each point is its own cluster, so we're basically merging the two closest points. In this really simple example, it's these two points here. Next, we merge the next two closest clusters, which in this case is going to be this individual data point and this cluster of two data points. And then we merge the next two closest clusters and merge and merge and merge and merge and merge and merge until finally all of our data points are in a single cluster. Now you can see because of how we created these clusters, there's a natural hierarchical relationship between the clusters. For instance, this big purple cluster is made up of this individual data point cluster and this big cluster containing the rest of the data points. So it has an incredibly simple algorithm, but there are some things we need to think about when creating our clusters. The first one is how are we gonna measure how close two data points are? Well, the traditional metric would be a Euclidean distance, just the normal type of distance that you're used to calculating. But we can basically use any similarity metric as long as it's symmetric. That means the distance between point A and B must be the same as the distance between B and A. Another really popular distance metric is Manhattan distance. Manhattan distance is basically the distance between two points as if you're walking in Manhattan where they have grid systems for their streets. For instance, if I wanted to get from this point to this point, I would go like this. Manhattan distance works with continuous data, just like Euclidean distance, but it's a little bit better performing when you have a ton of different dimensions. And we can use even more non-traditional distance metrics, like the Hamming distance, which gives you the distance between categories, or the cosine distance, which gives you the cosine between our two angles as a measure of how similar two points are. Cosine distance can be really useful when you want to do something like cluster customers based on the types of things they buy. You might have two customers, one who makes a ton of purchases every year and one who only makes a handful, but their purchasing patterns are similar. For instance, if one customer buys a lot of lipstick, so does the other one. This is because cosine distance doesn't really care about the overall counts, but the pattern between them. For example, if I have a customer that's buying four lipsticks and four eyeshadows per year, that customer has very similar buying patterns to another customer who buys two eyeshadows and two lipsticks a year. Now, one customer is buying a lot more overall, but they have similar patterns, so I might want to cluster them together. Cosine distance doesn't really care how long this line is, it just cares about the angle. So in this case, these two customers would have a cosine distance of zero. So again, a distance metric helps us decide how far apart two individual points are. However, we're not always working with individual points. So the other 
other thing that we need to think about is how do we define how far apart two clusters are? In order to do that, we have to choose a linkage criteria. Let's talk about a couple of different linkage criteria we might use. The first linkage we can look at is single linkage. Single linkage looks at the minimum distance between our clusters. In other words, it looks at all pairs of points where one point is in cluster A and one is in cluster B, and the minimum of those distances is our distance between clusters. As you can tell, single linkage doesn't care where any of the other points in the clusters are. It's only measuring the distance between the two closest points. On the other end of the spectrum, we have complete linkage. Complete linkage defines the distance between two clusters as the maximum distance. In other words, we look at every pair of points where one is in A and one is in B, and we find the maximum distance between them. Just like with single linkage, complete linkage doesn't care about any other point, just the two that are furthest away from each other, where one is in A and one is in B. Next, we have average linkage. While complete and single linkage only cared about a single distance between a pair of points, average linkage looks at the average distance between a point in A and a point in B. Centroid linkage looks at the distance between the centers of our clusters. Typically, this is going to be the mean of each of our clusters. And last but not least, we have wards linkage. And wards is typically the default in a lot of clustering functions. Wards measures the distance between two clusters as the increase in the within cluster variance when you merge two clusters. Within cluster variance basically measures how far on average data points are from the center of a cluster. And if you merge two clusters that are already pretty close together, your within cluster variance is not gonna go up very much. But if you take two clusters that are incredibly far apart and you merge them, then the within cluster variance will go up a lot. And thus your wards linkage will tell you these clusters are very far away. We'll talk a little bit more about this in class but for now, I want you to think about what are some situations where you might choose one linkage over another. All right, so now we've discussed how to choose a distance metric, which measures the distance between two individual points, and a linkage criteria, which helps you measure the distance between two clusters. So now we know everything we need to know to actually create a hierarchical clustering algorithm. When we've done so, we create a tree structure called a dendrogram. This helps us visualize the relationship between all of our clusters. Remember, in agglomerative clustering, every data point starts off as its own cluster, and then we merge successively until all data points are in the same cluster. And a dendrogram helps us visualize these merges. For instance, here you can see that these two data points were merged together. An important thing to remember is that the x-axis in our dendrogram means absolutely nothing. The only thing we want to pay attention to is the vertical or y-axis. The vertical axis tells us how dissimilar two clusters were before they were merged. The shorter the distance, the more similar two clusters were before they were merged. The taller the distance, the more dissimilar two clusters were before they were merged. Because of this, dendrograms can help us understand the performance of our clusters. For instance, when I see this dendrogram, I see a really tall distance up here, which means that when our two final clusters were merged together, they were pretty dissimilar. However, when I look at the bottom of my dendrogram and I see these very short vertical distances, this tells me that those two clusters, in this case two data points, were very similar when they were merged. The bottom of our dendrogram basically tells us about the density of our clusters. If you think about what density means, it basically means that data points are very close to their closest neighbors. And we can tell whether or not that's happening using the bottom of the dendrogram. If we have very dense clusters, then the first few merges that we make are going to have very short vertical distances because those data points are very close to their neighbors. However, if we see a lot of tall vertical distances, that typically indicates that we didn't have high density. Because if the first few merges that we make are between clusters that are very dissimilar, probably means that we don't have high density. On the other hand, we want to look at the top of the dendrogram to tell us a little bit about the separation between our clusters. If we have very separate clusters, then when those clusters are finally all merged together at the very end, when we put everything in one cluster, we should see really tall vertical distances. That's because if we have very distinct clusters, then when we do finally merge them together, they should be very different. 
Here's an example of a dendrogram that clearly shows a lack of density in the clusters. We can see this because the vertical distances are pretty tall in the first few merges, meaning data points aren't super close to their neighbors. We also see a lot of merges happening in this sort of mid-range of the dendrogram. This again indicates that we don't have very high density. So now that we know how to do hierarchical clustering, why might we choose it? Well, the most obvious reason to choose hierarchical clustering is if you think that there is a hierarchical relationship between your clusters. If you want to be able to say that a cluster is made up of subclusters and know what those subclusters are, you should use hierarchical clustering. Another pro is that when we build a hierarchical clustering model, we're just building that entire dendrogram, which means we can grab any number of clusters that we want. The way that we do that is basically by drawing a horizontal line. If we drew a horizontal line here, we would get our two clusters, this cluster coming from this line and this cluster coming from this line. But we could also cut our dendrogram here. This would give us three clusters, this cluster, this cluster, and this cluster. And we can chop our dendrogram anywhere we want. So with hierarchical clustering, unlike our other algorithms, we can be flexible with how many clusters we want to see. Another pro is that hierarchical clustering is incredibly flexible. Because we have such a wide array of choices with distance metrics and linkage criteria, we can make sure that our model is fitting to the exact type of clusters that we want to prioritize. However, there are some cons. The first and most obvious one is that hierarchical clustering is incredibly slow. Now, this isn't a problem for mid-range data sets, but if you have thousands and thousands of data points or a ton of different features, hierarchical clustering can be pretty slow. And our last con is that hierarchical clustering is iteratively merging clusters together. And this means that once we merge two clusters, we can't ever unmerge them. So if it looks like the best choice to merge two clusters at one point, but later on we wish that they were unmerged and in separate clusters, we are not able to do that. And hierarchical clustering has been used for a lot of really cool things, most importantly, my master's thesis. In this case, we were looking at people's performance on a memory task, and we wanted to cluster people based on those performances. We thought there was a hierarchical relationship between our groups because you could be good at the task or bad at the task. And if you were bad at the task, there was probably multiple ways you could be bad. And that's exactly what we found. If you look at this graph, this is a measure of the performances of our three clusters. You can see that the red cluster, for reasons I won't go into, is the high performing cluster, while the other two are the low performing clusters. As you can see, you can perform poorly in multiple ways. Here, hierarchical clustering was used to cluster movie reviews, and here it was used to cluster actions based on videos, whereas here, hierarchical clustering was used to detect crime hotspots. Alright, that's all I have for you. I will see you next time.